Hello everyone, my name is Pastor Arthur Branner and I'm here with Light Channel Ministries and it's a privilege to be here to, to share this very important message. We're going to be talking about a message from the book of Revelation, one that is of extreme importance. But before we begin our study today, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we plead for your anointing to come as we open the sacred book of your word. Please, O oh God, open our hearts. While I am teaching and sharing, I'm listening also. Bless us that after we have heard your word and understood we would walk in humble obedience. This is my earnest prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. In Revelation, the 14th chapter, John the Revelator, the prophet of God, is taken up in vision. And the Bible declares that as John is taken up in vision, it says in verse 1 of chapter 14, And lo, I looked, and a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having the Father's name written in their foreheads. This distinct group of people are there in the vision of John, and John sees that there is something of great importance and significance about these people. These people are of utmost importance, especially as it relates to the last days. Why is that? It is because God has a people unto himself that he desires with all of his heart to be revealed to the world in the power and the strength and the character of God. What is this name written upon the foreheads of God's people. In the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter or the eighth chapter, notice carefully what Paul says. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continue not in my covenant and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. And then he goes on to say, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. When John seen the 144,000 there on Mount Zion, he sees this group of people with the Father's name inscripted upon their head. It is not literally written there, but spiritually it speaks to the condition of these people, that they are a covenant people, a people who have the law of God inscribed upon their hearts and in their minds. This means that these people are endowed with a measure of God's spirit to the, to the degree that it reveals in their life a likeness to the measure of Jesus Christ himself. These group of people, the 144,000, in the end of time, they literally have the mind of Christ. And it's significant because this same group of people is spoken of in Revelation, the 14th chapter in verse 12, that says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. They keep the commandments of God, which means that they love the Lord God with all their hearts, souls, and mind. How do I know this? Because in John, the 14th chapter and verse 15, the Bible says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Here are a group of people whose hearts are sold out for Christ, 
who love him with all of their heart, soul, and mind, so much so that their lives represent the life of Jesus Christ. For spoken of in this selfsame chapter of Revelation, the 14th chapter in verse 5, the Bible says, In their mouth is found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Their likeness is so much like the Savior himself that in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21, the Bible says, Even hereunto were you called because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. The 144,000 perfectly reproduced the character of Christ, and in this time in earth's history, as John sees these events unfold at the very end of earth's history, it reveals a people who keep all of the commandments of God. And the issue that takes place at the end of time is with regards to one commandment in particular, and that is the fourth commandment. These people, when the fourth commandment is challenged throughout the world, will maintain their integrity, they will maintain their strength of conviction and live out the will of God at a time when the fourth commandment is tested throughout the world. What is the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It is at this time in earth's history when John sees this group of people, they stand for the truth of God's holy Sabbath day when all the world chooses a false Sabbath. And what is it about these people? Why is this so significant at this time? I will say to you because the whole world has been estranged from God, but these people are commandment keepers and maintain the covenant of God and reveal the personhood, the power, and the presence of God Almighty himself. But while the Sabbath is a very significant issue that culminates the last final final events of earth's history there is still yet one thing that's of even greater enormity than the sabbath itself and this is the burden of this particular study as we dive into god's word to understand this subject full and filthy i want us to begin with the church represented in laodicea the revelation of Jesus, chapter 3, verse 15, where the Bible says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The church represented here is none other than the church of Laodicea. The word Laodicea means a people judged. This church takes place at the time when judgment occurs on the earth at the very final hours of earth's history. And the Bible says of this church, they are cold, they are neither cold nor hot. They are lukewarm. Their experience is not one that they're on fire for God, neither are they totally turned off from God, but their experience is one that they are nominal in their relationship with Christ. And yet the true witness, Jesus himself, calls to the church and gives them a warning with loving regard. He reaches out to them and he tells them, I would, would that you were either cold or hot. If you choose not to turn from your ways, I will spew you out of my mouth. Jesus says, as a result of their condition in verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knoweth not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind. Their condition leaves them in such a predicament 
that the Bible says that God now desires to spew them out of his mouth. But praise the Lord, God always has a remedy in order for us to reverse the curse of sin. And God, the true witness, Jesus Christ, to the church of Laodicea, bids us to return from our wicked ways. And hence, notice carefully, the Bible says in this verse that the church is miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Here's the question. Why is the church of Laodicea naked? Notice carefully, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesaf, that thou mayest see. There it is. The church of Laodicea is naked, and as a result, her shame is revealed. What is this nakedness? It's not a literal nakedness, but her spirituality is divested of all that is pointed toward that which is vital for their need to be overcomers, their need to be a people who fully represent Christ. Let's go back to the story you remember. Moses is assembled there amongst the people. He begins to share with them all that the Lord had desired and required of them. The people, in hearing the words of Moses, resound with saying, all that the Lord has said we will do. And with that, the Bible tells us that Moses sprinkled blood upon the people. It was Moses' way of showing and revealing that God had synchronized their hearts with his and that they were in harmony with the will of God and desiring to do all that he has required of them to do. And then the Bible tells us something very significant. There in Exodus 24 and verse 15, 18, uh, verse 15 and 18. And Moses then went up to the mount and a cloud covered the mount. And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. There you have it. Moses then leaves the people. He goes up to the mountain to commune with God, to receive a message from God Almighty himself. I want to pause for a moment because I believe throughout Scripture there are serious examples of times where people go to the mountain for a very special reason. When people go to the mountain, special things happen, and I believe that God spiritually is calling us to a higher place in Jesus in these last remaining final days of earth's history. God Almighty invites us to commune with him, to come to a place of closeness, to not live in the lowlands, but to live on the mountaintop. It's God's desire, his fervent appeal to his people. Jesus desires for us to commune with him during this sacred hour of earth's history. As Moses was there in the mountain and he began to commune, the Bible says that he was literally there for 40 days and 40 nights. In the meanwhile, the people who were there down in the valley began to wonder, where is Moses? He's brought us out of the land of Egypt and now he's left us here in the wilderness to perish. What happened to him? Where has he gone? Why has he been gone so long? The people begin to worry. Their hearts are astir with a sense of dismay and wondering what has happened and has their leader forsaken them. And then the Bible declares that while Moses was there in the mountain for the last few remaining days while he was there, something began to happen, something of great significance. Notice carefully Exodus 31. The Bible says that God, as he spoke with Moses the last few remaining days, he began to share with him 
the importance and significance of the Sabbath. I find that it's interesting in these last days and times that one of the greatest and most significant subjects that will come to surface is that of the Sabbath. Notice verse 14 in Exodus 31, ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death, for whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord, Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generation for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and in the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon the Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. There you have it, Moses, in his last few days, God begins to emphasize to him the importance and significance of the Sabbath. Moses then along with Joshua, begins to head down the mountain to go a yet again and be with his people. As they are a short distance away, suddenly they hear the sound of what appears or sounds like what may be war. And Joshua says, I hear the sound of war. And Moses responds, that is not one who is, that is not the sound of war or one who, who is at mastery over the people. But this is the sound of them that, raise, that rise up to play. And as, as they come within vision of the people to see what is happening, the people are committing idolatry. Oh, you remember what happened when Moses went there amongst the people and he seen what was happening, that the people had totally forsaken God. They were dancing around a, an, a molten idol that had been created by Aaron himself. And when Moses confronts Aaron and begins to speak to him about this terrible sin that had taken place, Moses says these words. Aaron spoke to Moses, saying, For they said unto me, Make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Aaron says to the people, listen, they became somewhat afraid that you wouldn't return. They then, uh, I asked them for their gold. I threw the gold on the fire and voila, up jumps this idol out of nowhere. Well, we both know that that certainly cannot happen of its own. Aaron, in fact, made this idol to appease the people. But I want you to take notice of what the Bible says with regards to this issue as a result of them committing idolatry. Notice carefully verse 25. And when Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Did you catch that? The question that we have asked about the church of Laodicea is why are they naked? And here we discover as a result of coming down the mountain, seeing idolatry take place, Moses says that the people were naked for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame. And how did that happen? Because of 
their idolatry. In the book of Revelation, the third chapter, those who are rich and increased with good, the Laodicean church, the fact that they are rich and increased with goods points to the fact that idolatry is happening in their lives. Nakedness is a symbol of idolatry. You see, any time a people choose to worship or serve things rather than God, they are spiritually naked. Their shame was caused by their idolatry. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, why did they commit this idolatry? Idolatry had caused their shame and nakedness. But notice carefully, in the book of Genesis, we find out why shame comes as a result of idolatry. In Genesis 2 and verse 25, the Bible says, and they were both naked, that is, Adam and Eve, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. When God first created man, they were without shame. They stood in full confidence before their maker. They were naked, and yet there was no shame because they were covered with the glory of God, the light of heaven. Would to God that his people were covered with the light of heaven, the glory of God. And the Bible tells us that when Adam and Eve were placed there in the garden, there was one requirement. Of all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat, for in the day thou eatest thereof you will surely die. And then the Bible tells us that Eve strayed from her husband's side, and she happened upon that tree where she then begins to commune with the serpent. Of course, the serpent was none other than Satan himself. And as she began to talk with the serpent, he then seduced her into eating from the tree that God had told them not to eat of. She then immediately takes of the fruit and shares it with her husband. And the two of them then become aware of the fact that they are now naked. In fact, the Bible tells us that after they had both committed sin, God then comes and something interesting takes place. In Genesis 3 and verse 9, the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And of course, Adam responded in fear. And as a result, the Bible says, and he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. There it is. Their nakedness was revealed as a result of their sin. So think about this for just a moment. When God's people were there on the mountain, after Moses had returned, those who were there at the base of the mountain, their nakedness was revealed as a result of idolatry. And we ask the question, what was it that caused that idolatry, that nakedness to happen? And notice carefully here, we discover from this story that it was a result of their sin as a result of being ashamed ashamed of their sin. And notice carefully, the Bible tells us that because of fear, Adam and Eve became ashamed. Well, this makes sense because when the children of Israel were there at the mountain, base of the mountain, waiting for Moses to return, they had fallen into idolatry because they were fearful, they were afraid, they felt alone, they felt that Moses had abandoned them, and hence, as a result, they were filled with fear and began to indulge themselves in sin. Whenever we are empty of the presence of God, we begin to indulge ourselves 
in sin. That which should give of our greatest sense of satisfaction through a relationship with Jesus always becomes infiltrated by idolatry if we do not maintain a healthy, vibrant connection with Jesus Christ himself. And notice carefully, the Bible goes on to tell us that the reason that Adam and Eve had forsaken God because of their shame is because, listen carefully, they had lost their confidence and faith in God's word. Why do I say that? Well, notice carefully what the word of God tells us in Romans, the 10th chapter in verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, when, when God spoke to Adam and Eve from the very beginning, and he declared unto them that they were to live by his commandments and to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, instantly they were infused with faith because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As a result of eating from that tree, their faith now was compromised. So let's put this all together. When we are ashamed, it's because we are naked. When we are naked, it's because we have sinned. And we have sinned because we have lost confidence in God's word. And so it is the Laodicean church that is naked. It is because they have committed idolatry. They have committed idolatry because they are spiritually naked. They are spiritually naked because of their shame as a result of their sin and a lack of God's word in their life. So think about this for just a moment. God is speaking to his people in these last days and times. A people who are inundated with the wealth of this world, they're rich and increased with goods, and God is calling us to no longer walk in idolatry, but to walk in the fullness of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, one of the things that I seem to see as a pastor is that the church is so steep in the customs and the traditions and the things of this world we're so caught up in advancing in our, in our occupation or career. We're so caught up in the things of this world and being successful that wealth and riches have seemed to have taken the place of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we find our satisfaction oftentimes in the things of this world. And the Bible tells us, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. God wants a people whose hearts are renewed. God wants a people who have their hearts and minds stayed upon him that he can present the seal of God upon their hearts and in their foreheads. God wants unto himself a people who are ardently desiring to live for Christ, who have forsaken the things of this world and who have come to a full place in their life where they are fully sold out for Jesus Christ and that nothing matters more than the kingdom of God itself. Would to God that we would understand that God is calling us in these last and evil days to forsake all that the world has to offer and to come to a a savior that desires for us to receive the abundance for it is Christ who said I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health it is Christ who says that he wishes to give us the abundance of all things and so it is Jesus in this time in earth's history is calling unto himself a people a people who know and understand what it means to have a full out full-blown connection and relationship with Jesus Christ. Notice carefully what the Bible says in Galatians, the fifth chapter and verse 17. For the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other. Notice carefully. When we are not spiritual 
or stayed by the spirit of the living God, the Bible says we are in the flesh. What does that mean? I like the example some years ago of a pastor who says, if you ever want to know the definition of flesh, take the word flesh, drop off the H, and spell it backwards. The word flesh spelled backwards is S-E-L-F, self. The flesh is nothing more than the selfish nature that we were born with. But for the child of God who is born again, God calls us not to be selfish. But in fact, the true commitment to Christ is that we would, that we would forsake ourselves and follow Jesus. In fact, Jesus put it this way. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Whenever we are naked spiritually, we are in the flesh. God is calling his people in these last days and times to be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself, that we would not be naked, but that we would be spiritually garbed with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. It is these two entities that war against each other, the spirit and the flesh. Either we are living by the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit, or we are living in the flesh. Oh, my beloved, I believe that God is calling his people in these last days and times to realize that one of the prominent issues amongst God's people is idolatry. We are living primarily for the world. The world calls and beckons us on every side. And yet this war and contention is that God wants us to fight against the things of the world so that Christ lives in us. And the power of the Holy Spirit can be seen emanating from the lives of those who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Notice carefully in the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter in verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Notice carefully, the Bible talks about the works of the flesh. In other words, what selfishness entails. All of the things listed here that Paul speaks of in verse 19 through 21 are those things that control the selfish nature. And the battle within the heart of every Christian is to not allow self to govern, but Christ to be seated upon the throne of the heart and that Christ may express himself through our lives. Hence, Paul says in the book of Galatians, the second chapter and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life which I now live, I live by faith in the one who gave himself for me. I find it interesting because each of the things that are mentioned here in Galatians 5, verse 19 through 21, Paul speaks of in another New Testament book, but he describes it in a different way. Notice carefully in Colossians, the third chapter and verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Did you notice this? Paul named several of those virtues of the flesh mentioned in Galatians 5, verse 19, and he attributes that here in Colossians 3 and verse 5, and he refers to it as idolatry. 
the works of the flesh are manifest and referred to or symbolic of idolatry. Anytime these things are more prevalent in our lives than, than our relationship with Jesus Christ, anytime we spend more time edifying self than giving our hearts and lives and dedication and commitment to Christ, the Bible refers to it as idolatry. In fact, notice this quotation, a powerful quotation that says this, God has given us many things in this life upon which to bestow our affections, but when we carry to excess that which in, its, in itself is lawful, we become idolaters. Anything that separates our affections from God and lessens our interest in eternal things is an idol. So notice carefully, this statement literally says this, that if there's anything that we love, adore, more so than the time we spend in getting to know Jesus, how is it that we get to know Christ? We get to know Christ through the study of his word. We get to know Christ through prayer. We get to even know and experience Christ to a greater degree through sharing our faith with others. So let's make this really practical. If we would prefer to spend time on Facebook for other than ministry pursuits, rather than having our face in this book, we have allowed idolatry to enter our lives. When we would prefer and rather talk to our friends for hours and hours, and yes, we should have friends, and yes, we should love to embark upon our conversations with our friends, but if that is more important than spending time, precious time in prayer with Jesus Christ, perhaps our friendships have become an idol. When we would rather indulge and engage in selling and promoting all different types of things rather than selling and promoting, or I shouldn't say sell, but promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have become idolatrous. In an age and time when there are so many gadgets and so many things and so much to grab our attention and interest, in a time when Satan is provoking his people, seducing them with the things of this world, it remains a resolute need for God's people to keep their hearts and minds stayed on him. That God would have a people whose eyes are fixed and focused toward heaven, whose hearts are sold out toward Jesus, who have the fullness of the presence of the Holy Spirit abiding from within, a people who are becoming victorious victorious over the flesh, a people who are dominated by the power of the Spirit. And so it is at this time in earth's history that God is calling his people, the Laodicean church, to be far removed from the idolatry that Satan desires to seduce us with and to stand on the mountaintop and commune with God because he has called us to be the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. God is calling for his people to be resolute in our desire and determination to live by design and purpose for one cause, and that is that the day will come when we hear the voice of the master say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The true witness to the church of Laodicea is calling us out of this world not in the sense of being physically removed, but being connected with heart to Jesus, a people who have the covenant of God inscribed upon their hearts, so much so that every aspect, every portion, every part of their life is committed to being connected with Jesus Christ. You see, I believe that God wants us to recognize that in the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter, where Paul speaks of both the, the lust of the flesh and he speaks of 
the fruits of the Spirit. The fruits of the Spirit, of course, are found in Galatians, the fifth chapter, in verse 22, only two verses from verse 19 that outlines the works of the flesh. But I want you to see something in particular about what Paul says regarding the fruits of the Spirit in contrast to the works of the flesh. You see, the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And oftentimes I hear Christians say and refer to these virtues as the fruits of the Spirit. But the Bible refers to them as the fruit of the Spirit. Why is that? Because there is really only one fruit, and that fruit is love. But love that has eight different faces. Love smiling is joy. Love resting is peace. Love enduring is long-suffering. Love nurturing is gentleness. Love thriving is goodness. Love believing is faith. Love yielding is meekness. Love deciding is temperance. Now, why am I saying this? Here's the reason why. Because Paul, in verse 19, in outlining those works of the flesh, they too are, there is really only one work of the flesh. And it too has eight different faces. You see, lust of the flesh, as described, there is adultery, fornication, and lasciviousness. And the opposite of love, the fruit of love, is not, as many would think, hatred, but the opposite of love is fear. The Bible tells us, perfect love casteth out fear. So when we see the works of the flesh, there are just simply eight different faces of fear. Adultery is the fear of being lonely. Anger is the fear of losing control. Idolatry is the fear of losing happiness. You know, many people have idols in their lives because they believe that things will make them happy. Witchcraft is the fear of losing power. Heresies is the fear of losing popularity or notoriety. Envy is the fear of, of losing uh, notice or losing popularity. And then drunkenness is the fear of reality. Many people drink and indulge in, in drugs and alcohol and these different things as a means of escaping reality. And then finally, revelings, which is partying, merrymaking. People fear being able to have an abundant life. In other words, it's the fear of normalcy, having a normal life, one that is, that is not exciting. And so people want to make sure that their lives are filled with excitement and always with joy. And so contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is the work of the flesh, and the works of the flesh are idolatry steeped in fear. Oh, beloved, Jesus died on the cross that we would be overcomers, that we would be a people who would be able through the power of Jesus Christ to live that life in abundance, a life that forsakes, forsakens those things of the world idolatry as we call it. The people of God in the last days, while the Sabbath will be a significant and important virtue, even more important than that, is that in order for us 
to maintain our integrity to uphold the Sabbath, we will first need to rid ourselves of all the idols we find in this world that draw for our attention. In fact, in the book of Revelation, the 13th chapter, and verse 4, the Bible says this, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? Those that follow the beast power will worship the dragon. Those who worship the dragon are those who have not escaped the ensnarement of idolatry. Let us be a people whose hearts are fixed upon Jesus. Our lives are stayed upon him, and we have forsaken the things of this world. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for being a God who has called us from the things of this world to see and embrace a full measure and experience with Jesus Christ. Please, O oh God, empower us to live for you and to forsake the things of this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.